<laughs> it's a great privilege to be here with you today, and uh, I'm enjoying myself. If you need a chair, you tell me. We'll stick one behind. Okay. Well, I'm going to stand on my own sand leg over there. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. No, I'm uh, a man of few words, they say, and uh, I, um, I love life, I love plants, I love God. And I don't understand, and I don't know about all of these things. I had a little German grandmother, and she says, T, you talk all the time, you should be listening. <laughs> and she was right. And I have evidence when I listened, I cut my finger off. And that taught me a lesson. Don't stick your finger in everything. <laughs> and so uh, I often wonder, and I'm a great believer in biblical archaeology, and uh, I say, it could have happened. And then my wife says, don't say that, it did happen. <laughs> so everywhere I go, I get contradictory because I don't know all of these things. But I'm trying. And I've only had 93 years, so give me six more, and then after that I'm going to settle down and have a good time. But I have a good time doing just what I like to do. And my grandmother used to sing. And needless to say, I couldn't carry a note in a bucket, but she said, oats, peas, beans, and roses grow, but do you or I or anybody else know how oats, peas, beans, and roses grow? And I, I'm still ignorant, but anyway, I think that was wonderful. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I have a policy of bragging, but uh, I'm so happy to be alive. And I, as I mentioned, uh, I follow biblical archaeology. I'd love to talk with you a little bit later on that. Proof of the pudding, so to speak. And uh, I uh, did get my early studies at Clemson, and uh, uh, I was, all my people were dairymen, and I, I got tired of cows. And, um, <laughs> so they put me into a place called horticulture. God knows I didn't know what in the world that big word was. Me, a little farm boy from South Carolina, and you go and find out about horticulture. I said, Lord have mercy. But my junior year, I started teaching because I didn't like the way it was done, so I wrote my own D book. And then I was happy, very happy. And my department head said, we're going to make you a professor. I said, oh boy, so I got married. Uh, he said, you shouldn't have done that. I said, well, the girl loves me. She begged me. Uh, she was a milk lady, you know. She, her father had a dairy. Well, here I am. And he said, well, either you go to graduate school or I'll fire you. I was making $100 a month. My God, all that money. Well, anyway, uh, I, was, I, I am the luckiest guy in the world, if you can just stick with me a little bit. And I went, um, I, there was a guy from uh, overseas, we'll say, and he was a good pathologist. So the University of Tennessee gave me uh, um, a staff in plant pathology. I hardly knew how to spell the word, I don't want to know. But anyway, I had a wonderful, wonderful time. And then, then your uncle um, started up something, and um, I had to go. But I was very, very fortunate in that because I got to go to Harvard and MIT. And Harvard, uh, the uh, laboratory in botany. And that was just absolutely wonderful. But I was moved over into uh, ultra top secret communications, and I was uh, sent into that particular category on uh, the uh, Admiral flagship, and I spent six years with that. So I learned an awful lot, and I ended up in uh, China, and then I ended up in Japan, I ended up in uh, the various islands and all of that. So I, I got to learn a lot. But I have uh, one of his knees as a reminder. But the beauty of it was, I found out I didn't know anything. And so I started all over again to try to find out what makes plants grow. Why do plants grow? So I was in China and involved with some wonderful, wonderful people. And they eat fish, they eat all these things, you know. So we were talking about sea serpents. 
And I said, oh boy, I like that. And, I went, and they said, well, they're deadly poisonous. And I said, well, make some poisonous. And they said, well, let's go catch some. Which we did. And I said, I got to see inside. I'm, and I, we, we, we very, you know, I'm not a surgeon, but you could just cut down through there. And they were eating seaweed. But we don't like to refer to seaweed. We are plants. We are beautiful little plants. And please call us sea plants, not sea weeds. Weeds are bad. But anyway, this was a bad weed. There are more sea plants than there are land plants. The difference is, anyway, we got at those and we found out the toxic principles in there that were toxic to humans but not to the to the serpents. And so we moved the serpents over, put them on a different diet, a different seaweed, and they lost their ability to poison. So that got me all excited with the, with the Chinese, and I still am very, very fortunate to get to work with them. And I still do, and I go over and lecture to them. And I brought back two beautiful Chinese girls to <laughs> work with me and to get a master's degree in biochemistry. And they, I wanted to keep them in the States, but they went back to China, which was fine. And then. The next thing that I got all excited about was uh, what makes plants grow? Do you or I? No, I don't know. But anyway, I uh, was looking for some type of plant and uh, I met the Consulate General of Norway. And uh, I was in Washington at that time. And uh, he and I, uh, well, let's say we had a little a toddy. And we got to talking, and I got to asking questions. And he said, why in the age don't you just come go with me to Norway? Well, I said, well, well, that we did. And so I went to Norway with him. And it ended up that we went up to the North Sea. And the most beautiful sea plant you have ever seen was Ascophila Mendoza. And we worked with that. And uh, I have uh, developed that this is, we can only harvest three months out of the year, and we can only harvest in one place every third year. And then uh, being a farm boy, I knew exactly how to cut the stuff and everything else, and I found out I was the biggest fool around. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, we got it, and we worked with it. And uh, so this is the particular one that I love and like, uh, and I've worked with uh, uh, all of the uh, different people to get clearance on it. And, uh, we, uh, I have it in six languages, and this is the Spanish language. And uh, wherever I hear about these different things, uh, then I'm very, very fortunate. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, if you read the Bible, there's an awful lot in there, whether we understand it or we don't understand it. But somewhere along the way, I got all excited about it biblical archaeology and uh, I went to uh, was very fortunate that I have always been interested was there a garden of Eden did they have all of these things so then I became interested in the uh, two rivers you know the Nile and the other coming down and it could be the garden of Eden so uh, I got invited believe it or not, over. And it was just wonderful because I was up and down in the Euphrates and up and down the Nile. And we did diggings and so forth. And um, that got me all excited. And so then, I, with uh, the help of others, of course, that um, I was in Iran, Iraq, and you know, Pakistan, and all of those places. and. Um, one guy said, well, you need to go and dig right where those two rivers come together. And uh, I said, well, I would love to see the Garden of Eden. So we went over and I spent a month over there learning a lot about that area of the world and the plants that grew there, how they grew there, what is organic matter, what was brought about in here. So, and then, uh, I was getting ready to come back, and the boys said, we want a surprise. So they had a pickup truck, and we went over there where we could look at the two rivers coming together. And uh, I saw a black hole over there, 
And the one guy got a ladder, another one had a flashlight, and one had a shovel. I said, what are y'all going to do? And he said, well, hell, we got more sense than that. We're not doing you going over there and dig. <laughs> and so I did. And I went over and dug, dug, dug. I went down 15 feet. And I did find particles of plant that could be, you know, the type of thing that was in that period of time, in that time. So I had a lot of fun with that. And then the next thing that uh, getting all exciting about was the same type of thing was learning how plants grow and what makes them grow and then get over into uh, going to China again and uh, then from there to Japan and uh, then I began to think, what about old Noah? You, you think the old boy really existed? Did he have a big boat? Was it a little boat? Did he have roses in there with it? And uh, so I, I got in trouble again. And um, the guy said, well, you know, why don't you come up to Canada? And so I went up to Guelph and we started talking about it because that's where the Rocky Mountains start. And if you think about Canada, and I was very, very fortunate up there. I got to go to school for uh, a semester, you know, and pulled me trying to learn something. And we talked about it. And then if you look at that and get samples and get soil samples, and then you come to Washington State, and then you come to Utah, wait, 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 wait now. This is a big rock. Maybe Noah was here. Maybe he <laughs> did get up there. And so uh, uh, we started looking and if you go up 10,000 feet above sea level then don't go down and dig for oil let somebody else all worry about that let, let's talk about plant life and what makes plants grow and how do plants grow so dig this way go in at 10,000 feet above sea level aha I made a collection of seashells Maybe old Noah was there. Good question. And so that's where we get our supply. And then, of course, what makes plants grow. And then from there, there are so many things. And people are so interested in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. Uh, I ignore those. I like to get with the little things that go a long way and cause a lot of things that bring about all of these changes. And so, in uh, the Indians and all of those, if you go there and climb those mountains, and then you'll find the most beautiful red color that you have ever seen in the designs and so forth. And if you dig inside there, there's no telling what you find. I have found rocks, I have found seashells, I have found bones. How did that happen? 10,000 feet. So there I am, ignorant again. And so we go on down, and I was invited down to Mexico to get involved in the type of thing because the Rocky Mountains ended, begin to go down, go down, and go down. And so then we found out, you don't have to go way down there. You can go to South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and you get asked questions, you know, where you get all these rocks? How'd they get here? And at Columbia, South Carolina, at one time was un underwater. And now that's 40 miles from the line. So, uh, yeah, I sure did. I got a back hole and we dug, and we went down 30 feet. And right outside of the city of Columbia, I found seashells. I also found some other bones and things from there. So I was uh, decided to. Uh, do the best I can and try to find out really what makes plants grow. Do you or I or anyone know how oats, beans, beans, and barley grow, and roses in particular? So I um, was very, very fortunate in getting to uh, work with the, the Japanese, especially in their particular material. And um, I've, another thing that I thoroughly enjoy doing, I would enjoyed teaching and that was one of my loves and I still do radio and TV at this time and I, I like to make people ask questions. Be, don't take my word for it. And so I got up there and was very, uh, you know, 
cocky, you know, and saying that uh, well, I'm pretty smart guy. We know about everything. From the cradle to the grave, we cover you. You know, like that. So I got home. I had a telephone call. This lady says, what are you doing for the blind? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. And so uh, the next day I went to the garden for the, um, I went to the school for the deaf and blind. And I was there talking and uh, little Ricky, blind sister birth, he and his brother, both blind sister birth. And he said, Dr. T, before you go home, I want to talk to you. I said, start talking, buddy. And he was, uh, he said, I want you to meet my tree. I said, what? So we go out. And Ricky took me through all the trees out there, and he identified an oak tree and a pine tree by feeling the bark and this type of thing. So I decided, that, hey, here's a place that we can help people. We can solve some of this. So I got a grant to work for a garden for the blind. And we put on the garden for the blind, developed one in Washington, D.C. Today, Rick Godfrey has a, a, a what do you call it, a truck, a travel thing, or whatever it is, goes from here way over there. He goes all over the United States playing every musical instrument that you can think of. But he loves plants. He wants to know how plants grow. And then he worked with me on germination of seed, soaking the seed in these antinog things. So there's some good in being ignorant, and that's what I am. So, <laughs> I'm interested in more of the hormones, the enzymes, the growth promoting substances, the endoles, the cytokines, the gibberellins, the betaine, chelation, buffering, and so forth. Now, um, we, oh, of course, we have NPK, but I'm interested in all of the others that uh, are related to us. And one of my pet peeves right now is that terrible thing called cancer. And so then we get involved, especially breast cancer. My wife died with breast cancer. My son died with cancer. And my, I'm, I remarried. And this current wife has breast cancer. So I want <clears throat> to get involved. And in working with the cancer institutes, we are using nanos, sugar, found in seaweed to see if we can upset and prevent the movement from the breast to the other parts of the body. So I feel we are doing something worthwhile by looking and doing that particular thing. And so I work with five different colleges in doing that and trying to solve the mystery. And looking at you, looking at me, looking at you, what did we get? prostate cancer. So I, I go back to the phone and we, I wish I could say that you know, there were cows, but they're pigs and they are young pigs. So in the study of that, may I just say gut or whatever you want to call it, it's very similar to ours. And by using one, some of these acids and these materials from Escaphyllum nodosum, is well worthwhile and we are getting supported by the medical profession and we have working with five states and four graduate students maybe we'll find out something at least we know we got a close relative a pig and so i'm very much interested in that yeah. is this seaweed that you've been studying edible so humans eat it can humans eat the seaweed Studies and working with. Can humans eat the seaweed? Oh, you, you do it every day. Okay. You probably, if it, if you go to a store, there there are more different things. Preservatives are used on that. There are soaps, lotions, pills. If you take a, a I won't call the name of it, but a pill is coated with material from this Ascophyllum nodosum that causes this elastic. That's a big word, I can't even say it. But anyway, it's sticky. It, it's kelp, Ron, it's kelp. Kelp. It's kelp. Oh, <laughs> you call it kelp. <laughs> kelp so, is a sort of word. 
anyway, uh, the thing that I'm interested in is when I put these two things together, and uh, I, I want to talk, am I running out of time? I, I, uh, I see a lot of people going How are we doing it, so far? But it, it, anyway, okay, I say go another one. Five, I, I, I want to tell minutes. you a couple more. And then I'll, okay.